Hello and welcome back to the Hypothesis episode 38 now. We have guests again in a row, which is very nice. So we have Grace with, with us today, but my name is Feely. I'm Patrick. I'm Liam. As you have heard, we have guest today called Grace. She's a third-year PhD candidate in biostatistics at the University of Waterloo in Ontario. So, so Welcome. first we're going to get to the into a topic. So feel free to jump in and provide your exciting knowledge on it. Or, you know, or your take on it. So anyone have an intro topic today? I do. Um, Grace, if you want to interrupt and say anything or comment or whatever, just tell me to shut up. Sounds good. Um, I'm good yeah. at that. <laughs> Excellent. So so I came across this podcast. It's another physics podcast called the Physics World Stories Podcast. Hosted by Andrew um, Glester or Gleestar. I'm not sure how to pronounce that, unfortunately. Um, and they had this episode discussing something called quantum music um so so the episode was called quantum melodies the intersection of music and quantum physics so quantum music's the idea of generating music with using quantum computers um it's this pretty new idea apparently and it's been slowly evolving i think um i think since about 2015 so so people were like okay in the 1970s kind of synthesizers were used to create music with classical computers, which became pretty popular. Um, they're in movies and TV and mainstream media and stuff. So they figured, let's try it with quantum computers and maybe something neat will happen. So, yeah, December 2022. So I, I went and researched this a bit. I, I admittedly didn't listen to the full podcast episode. I just went and looked it up online and read some articles about it. Um, yeah, December 2022 at Imperial College in London, there was a quantum music event slash conference where about 150 musicians and scientists in the field met to discuss the topic. So that's like a decent amount of people. And it was kind of like any other scientific conference, I guess, except now there was like music kind of performances throughout the conference, not just scientific demonstrations. And I think more scientific conferences could use that. Um, I think... I remember one conference we went to, Feely, they had a string quartet playing somewhere at it, and that was kind of fun. <laughs> that was CUPC in Ottawa. Yes, at the, the War Museum, for some at reason. The War Museum. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's deeply connected to physics and, and math. Right? I know a producer, kind of, that, that actually wrote his music, or like, you know, helped wrote his artist music by coding but coding the actual waveform. Like, the, his code would be something like cosine of something, you multiply by another sign, and I was like, oh, this is how you write music? Yes. I was like, what? Yeah, so I think the idea of this quantum music is that um, you're kind of, you're, you have quantum superpositions of things, and you get, like, wave interference from it, or I guess, like, probability wave interference, and somehow you transfer transpose that to actual music. So at this conference and in, in London, um what they had these like music demonstrations and the scientists would kind of have they'd have their laptops, they'd be up on a stage with their laptop and they their laptops would be connected through the internet to an actual quantum computer, um the IBM quantum computer actually. And what they would do is they could they would kind of manually control the state of a qubit a quantum bit and they would actually do this with their hand um i think the instruments there's that instrument called like a theremin or something where you like move your hand around and it makes these weird kind of alien sounds so they kind of did that actually with their with their laptops and they had these instruments that would register it and they would send that information to the quantum computer and it would kind of it would measure the state with whatever their hand was doing and then it would fire the information, they would send those results back to the laptop and then it would project the result. And it was some pretty wild 
it was very sci-fi sounding like it was it, it was an acquired taste i think for music um but but again this stuff's in its pretty pretty early stages so so since these quantum states they exist in superposition so there's this element of random randomness to the music um you kind of if you do the same thing 10 times in a row you're going to hear something different every single time and that's kind of appealing to some musicians um and if you, if you want to hear a track of this or kind of these scientists explain what's going on in some background music that they produce there's a nice eight minute long youtube video called sounding qubits quantum computing and musical creativity by the youtube channel sounding qubits um and they have another way to generate this music where they actually they they had a violinist um play their violin and it would take that sound it would send it off to the quantum computer and then the quantum computer would it would measure some qubit states and then send the results back and then you you kind of get the original you get something that kind of more or less sounded like the original audio that the violin produced but now it was changed so every single time you listen to it the idea is that it's it's different every single time because of this randomness due to the the qubits having superpositions um this is a super roundabout way to make music, right? Like I think before, just whack. It's like, well, I'm gonna make the the most um complicated filter possible, basically. It's well, like, well, yeah, that's that's the. It depends how you do it, I think, because I think it could be super random and just be kind of noise. Um, but if you do it like the way they were doing it with the violin, where you kind of put in some music that already exists. And then you you measure some quantum states. I don't know the exact mechanism, and then it spits out the same music, but slightly modified. It still sounds like pretty much the same thing, but a little weird. Um, so, yeah, it's yeah, still you, early you put, stages. You put it through a, a some kind of function, or maybe not exactly a function, right? Some kind of map onto mm -hmm. something, and, and it's basically like a big big filter or a basic modifier. Like you know, when when you plug a your guitar into like an amplifier or like a little box of effect, it just the effect just called quantum computer. What's the big deal? I mean, it's it's challenging technologically, but I don't think that's uh at least to me it's not very appealing. I can see why it might be like fun to some people, but it's like yeah, to me that's not what music is supposed to be. <laughs> well, I think it depends how you do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I feel like. If this became super mainstream, I would just get frustrated that like I couldn't sing along to the same song every single time. I'd be like, why? Why did the melody change? Like it's super interesting and it kind of like relates to the math behind like, you know, you project something. Can you get that original thing back? And if so, how does it change based on like all these operations that you're doing? Like it's super cool. Does it have applications in like, is it going to change the way of music? Probably not. But it's a very cool application of quantum physics, I'd say. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. Um, but again, you know, I think people said the th same thing about original electronic music, which just used regular bits. They're like, well, that's kind of weird, but it's it's neat, but I don't think it'll ever catch on. And it's a huge thing now. Um, electronic music doesn't have to be digital. The theremin is analog. Right, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it's just anything that uses like circuitry, uh, or basically the origin original, you know, uh, electronic music. So it's a, another interface to create music, but I don't think you have to make it super complicated or you know go to some weird filter. But you know, maybe maybe because I'm not an electronic music person, I don't really get it. I need to see the the actual instruments and feel the people playing it. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm the same. I don't I don't think I fully understand it. I'm just kind of paraphrasing what I read in like a news article. Um uh yeah, and it's it, it's again, it's super new. It's pretty limited and not accessible because not everyone has a quantum computer just sitting on their desk. Um I do. Quantum computers are <laughs> nah, damn. No, I don't. <laughs> You're rich as hell. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm a PhD student. Uh, Waterloo might have one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like Quantum computers, you need to keep them like cryogenically frozen because you don't want the qubits to interact with anything or else they decohere and become classical. And even like, you know, Google and IBM are these 
huge companies. The current quantum computers they have still aren't like that good. Mm. Um, like the biggest, the the largest amount of qubits in a quantum computer right now is IBM's, and it's like four hundred thirty three qubits or something around there. I might be slightly off. Yeah, we have a quantum computing center at my mm-hmm. university, but it's like literally behind lock and key. Like I cannot get in there. You need a like a passcode to even get into like the study spaces that those students have. So like, what do they have behind those doors that I don't know? So yeah, mysterious. quantum, com- quantum computing is very much. Um, it's a lot faster than classical computing, and if you have a quantum computer, you can you know in principle guess it like perform calculations that would take years and years and years in a couple seconds so it's very like it's a it's a huge money maker if you can do it but it's also pretty dangerous technology if it falls into the wrong hands well, it's a very specialized machine right mm-hmm. like it's, it's not well it's well, it depend depend what you mean by the wrong hand or you talking what are you talking like the illuminati or something <laughs> Aliens? I don't know what you're talking Someone about. Someone who but... wants to hack my bank account by instead by entering every possible password, which would normally take millions of years, but a quantum computer can do it in about like twelve minutes. Yeah, I'm sure if they um they have access to quantum computers, they don't need to hack your bank account. Yeah. But... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but Fair yeah, I can see, I can see the the downside um, of it, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, I just thought this was kind of like a neat little it's it's kind of funny how much how stuff like gets developed that you wouldn't even think about. Like this oh, like it makes sense. We have we have regular electronic music from classical computers, why not quantum computers? But it's not something I ever would have just like thought about. Um so so one last comment on this. Um the scientist named Eduardo Miranda, he's he appears in this podcast as a guest and he appears in this youtube video um he published the first book on this on the topic of quantum music titled quantum computer music foundations methods and advanced concepts and apparently it's like a proper science textbook there's math and quantum mechanics and stuff in it it's not just like for your average person who doesn't know math so if you're interested in quantum music and you know some quantum mechanics <laughs> check that book out i guess some light reading for your bedside table. Light reading for the average physicist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah put you to bed real quick. <laughs> All right. All right, thank you, Liam, for the intro topic. Oh, my last comment on that is like, things take some time, very long time, to, to go from research to commercial. So that's why we don't see a lot of stuff, but we hear a lot of stuff if you're in the field, right? You hear about these amazing new material. You won't, you won't see them in any of your product in maybe 20 years, at least, or something like that. Anyway, so, but, so our main topic today is all about grace. Oh my. <laughs> oh, so grace studied biostatistics. Oh, well, still does now. But the way we know grace was, she was briefly in physics, briefly. <laughs> I made a guest um, appearance. Very briefly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she was a cameo in physics for her. I think during her our second year undergrad, we went to undergrad together in the same year, and she started off doing a bit of physics, and then she branched off to the the harder <laughs> counterpart mathematics. That was a it was a quite an experience. So, anyways, the how we know Grace. So, Grace, why don't you tell us or the audience in your own words what exactly do you do? I do a lot of things. Um, yeah, I my main focus and my research area is in biostatistics. So that's like developing statistical methodology with applications in health. So that can be pretty general. It could be like in neuroscience, analyzing clinical ICU data, looking at genetics problems. Um, there's so many areas just within biostatistics alone and statistics like in a larger family. So yeah, I did my master's in math at the University of Waterloo, and I majored in biostatistics. And then I just, the the pandemic hit and I didn't know what to do. So I decided, why not do a PhD? And now here I am four years later, 
Um, so yeah, I'm in my third year. I'm a, officially a candidate, which is pretty cool. And yeah, I, so my main position in Waterloo is as a researcher. I am working on my dissertation and I'm working on a variety of projects through that in the biostatistics field. And I'm also a statistical consultant at the university, which means that I provide statistical guidance or do analyses on like basically anyone in the university's projects that if they need help. So that's pretty cool because I am not just like limited to my own research. Like I've worked with people in the arts, in economics, engineers, um, earth scientists, uh, lots of different fields that I probably would never have experience with had I not been in this position. So that's pretty cool. And yeah, my research specifically right now is looking at basically complex longitudinal data. So what that means is that we have data where we are getting repeated observations on people over time. So let's say that I have an ICU data, um, like data from an ICU, and you have people who can be monitored multiple times throughout their stay, whether it's through nursing notes or you have like a blood pressure machine, you're getting these, these readings over time. And that causes issues for analysis because those observations are correlated. And we have methods that can deal with that. But what kind of makes things go sideways when we analyze them is that if the timing of the observations is related to the outcome that we're analyzing. So let's say we're trying to look at um, the overall health of a patient through some measure. If that is related to the times at which they are observed, then that can cause bias into our estimates. So if thicker patients are looked at more often, then that can cause bias. And that's like kind of what my research deals with. All right. Uh, I want to um, trace back a little bit on, on, well, I think some people, at least I think including me, I'm not really sure what you mean by, you say, I'm a statistician. Yeah. It's like, what does that mean? You know, I am, well, I, well, one could say that you could imagine a person just like with a calculator and just right. like crunching numbers when you see that. Well, how do you describe statisticians? Yeah, so I think that's the common misconception. And even when I started this program, I didn't realize how like theoretical it was. I was like, oh, a statistician, you calculate the mean, you calculate the mode, you calculate the median, you compare them, you might fit a line. But like, in essence, a statistician is someone who de well, in my definition and in my experience, we're the ones that is, are developing methodology for researchers to use. So a lot of my work is like theoretical. It's looking at the properties of different methods and how we can um, expand existing methods to deal with like new problems that arise. Um, yeah, so it's not so much number crunching, like we kind of do that. And that's often like, if you write a statistical paper, you propose this methodology and then you're expected to have some application of it. And that's kind of where you do the number crunching and the coding. Yeah, the way I see it is like, you are like the mathematical strategist. So it's like, you know, because like mathematician usually it's like, oh, we got to find the truth of beautiful math about the world is how it works. But the statisticians are more like, okay, there's data that has some structure in it. You mm -hmm. know, you need to use this data to solve some problem, right? But you don't know how to deal with those data. And we'll come with a strategy to do that. And I do research in statistical mechanics, which mm -hmm. is like using stats for physics. It's basically the same thing, right? You, there are a bunch of statisticians working on information theory. It's like, well, we can develop these ideas that help you uh, well, use this type of knowledge um, or data. Totally. Fun. So, was that like appealing to you? And when you were applying, like because you said, like if you didn't really know exactly what how theoretical it was, that, so and you real realized it was something you really like to do. Yeah. So I, what I like, what kind of drew me to this discipline was, well, I was kind of debating between epidemiology and biostatistics because I liked doing math and I like it was something I was good at. And I also have interest in health, but I like pass out when I see blood. So doing med school and stuff was just like not an option for me. Um, and yeah, basically I was told like often 
like these two sets of people have different skill sets, but there are less biostatisticians out there. And like my skill set would be better suited to be a biostatistician because I come from like an applied pure mathematical background. So they thought that that would be my supervisor at the time um, was talking to me and he was like encouraging me to try biostat. And then um, it's funny because when the pandemic hit, epidemiologists became like the coolest people in the world. And it kind of gave me at least like a talking point to explain what I do. So the epidemiolo- epidemiologists like have a specific question that they want to answer and they're like very well suited to analyze the data, but often they don't have the tools that they need to analyze this complex data. Like in the pandemic, we had, you know, so much going on. The biostatisticians are the ones that like develop the methods for the epidemiologists to use. So shout out to COVID for like giving me a good example and everyone knows what an epidemiologist does now. So it makes it a little bit easier for me to explain what I do at least. I feel like there's also trouble getting data in certain fields. And I think COVID, there was a lot of readily available data on like who had COVID and where in the world and that kind of stuff. So maybe that helps too. It's true, but also like it poses, so there's like so much data, which is like really good, but also really hard computationally. And a lot of this data is extremely biased because you can't really look just at the raw data and say, oh, the numbers went up and the numbers went down. Because like in the beginning of the pandemic, you can think we weren't, the average person wasn't allowed to get tested. You had to have like traveled outside of the country. So the numbers were underreported. And then later on, we had rapid tests and those weren't being reported. And you have like certain demographics not having accessibility to the tests as other demographics. So you have like sampling bias. So these are all the types of things that we have to think of as both epidemiologists and biostatisticians when we're dealing with these like complex um, situations, especially when it's happening in real time. Like there was a huge press for methods like there already had existed some, but I think the amount of data was just like a lot (laughs) to handle at the beginning. Well, well, you said that because you have your background in math, um, in pure math, you're more suited for the biostatistics stuff. Well, what are other people in your your field or your your colleagues or your your fellow classmates? um, What are their background in if not math? I, I thought all statisticians just have pure math background. Who else would go into you know, doing this. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm not completely unique. There are other like math majors, but for me, like a lot of people went to larger schools who had actual stats programs. So they have been doing statistics since like second year. Whereas I came from a school where we had maybe seven stats courses that I could take and I took them all and I have like a concentration in statistics, but I would never have enough courses to have a a pure major like I went to Waterloo and it was such a, a a shock to me how much I felt behind because I was in this these courses on like hypothesis testing and like very specific areas of statistics and I was seeing this t- this level of material for the first time like you know if you take a random stats course you're introduced to hypothesis tests but there's like a lot of theory behind them And my classmates were like, oh, we did this in stat 450. I was like, I didn't have any 400 level stats courses at my school. Like I felt so behind. So they had more of like the stats side because they came from a math faculty, not just like a math department, which was such a change for me. Yeah, I think that's one of the downsides of small universities. And I've also noticed that and I'm sure everyone here has going to a bigger university after going to St. FX, like this tinier one. Tinier ones, you, they're kind of nicer because, you know, there's less of you and there's more, like, there's a, there's, um, you get more office hours with your profs and you get more research opportunities. But then, yeah, you're kind of just given, like, courses, like, these are the courses you're taking. And they're kind of more, like, general courses. And I noticed that as well. Like, there's all these courses I've been taking here on and off and there's there are courses that i know under people took during their undergraduates at other universities and i'm like in my second year phd taking them and it's like what i know that was such a thing because i'm always like when i first went to waterloo i was like oh my gosh i 
I can't do this because I don't just I have the skills I'm sure but I do not have the background for this I was playing catch up for the first like two months I mean eventually you get there we all experience this like you you can do it you just have to kind of put in the work and that's not to say that I like I don't regret going to a small school like I look at the culture, I mean, State of X had its own like weird culture. <laughs> we don't have to talk about that. But like the culture in the classrooms at like State of X was very community driven. Like we all like in our own programs, we all worked together. We were like teammates. We weren't overly comp- competitive and like sabotaging each other. Whereas at a lot of these big schools, it is so competitive because everyone's fighting for the same research positions and co-op positions. And it's it's just like a different you know, there's two edges to the sword. You get like all these cool classes, but you have a thousand people in them and it's super competitive. Or you go to the smaller school and you have like a great sense of community. You're very close with your professors. You have like m- more op- one-on-one opportunities, but less like coursework. So for me, I don't mind. Like I don't regret the route that I took because I think I would have like drowned if I went to a large school and that is also because like I had mental health issues or I have mental health issues and those like followed me throughout university and being in the small class environment was like really beneficial for me Mm -hmm. um and I don't think that the some of these other schools would have been right for me that's not to say that it would have been right for not been right for anyone else but for me I'm like glad that I did the small school to big school thing (laughs) I like to point out also that you know there are people from different disciplines completely who start a PhD. Let's say you know there are a bunch of engineers who start a PhD in physics or yes. chemists or like chemistry background. So they're missing a lot of backgrounds and almost like when they take class, they're like, "Oh my god, like do I belong here? Can I do this?" But I think my response to those is actually like you know. I don't know where I got this from. Like, well, just believe in your supervisor because you're there and the expert in the field, right? You're just like a newbie in the field. How do you judge that you can, you can't? Your supervisor, your advisor hire you believing that you can. So, and, and they're experts in the field. So believe them, right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, just a quick comment. I can vouch for that. Having switched from physics to earth sciences, uh, your supervisor, if they vouch for you, you're probably skilled enough. Exactly. Um, but going back, going back to statistics, I'm just curious. So what kind of tools do you use to actually apply the different methods that you come up with or method testing? What do you actually use to do statistics? Because I imagine it's not just punching numbers into a calculator. Yeah, there's actually a lot of like theoretical mathematical proofs that go into developing statistical methodol- methodology. Um, like... In terms of mathematical tools, we use so much calculus, linear algebra, analysis. That's something that I wish I was stronger in was like real analysis. Um, Yeah, there's so much like optimization problems. You are trying to make sure that your solution is the best and valid in large sample sizes. And you, you use like asymptotics and stuff like that to test the validity of your methods. And then we also, so like from the mathematical perspective, that's what we do on paper. And then when we want to test the method on real, like how it will behave on data, we do a lot of simulations. So we simulate data that has properties and distributions and like facts that we can control and know to say like, oh, the mean is four. I can simulate data where the mean is four. I run the model and I want to see if the estimated mean is pretty close to what it should be. And you'd run that like thousands and thousands of times and you say on average it's four and it's very like narrow, like sometimes you get 3.9, sometimes you get 4.1. You're not getting like minus 10 and 10 and minus 100 and 100. So you're looking at like the estimates that you're that your method is putting out you're looking at on average how does it perform and also the variation in the estimates that you're getting that's just one example but we use a lot of simulations um that's like my favorite part of it i think it's so fun to just like simulate the data make it makes weird things happen you can like violate assumptions and then run it through see how sensitive your method is to different violations and yeah that's kind of how you test your 
it sounds a lot like physics to me. It is. Uh, or I don't know if it's for everyone else. You create a model that that describes something, right? And, and a lot of things physics, like let's say Isaac models, it's it basically like just what you did. We have this random data with certain distribution, right? Like your initial state, and you put through this the Ising system, which is uh, you know the magnetic system of spins, whatever. And uh, you see how it behaves. You disturb it a bit and see how it behaves. You give the different um, initial condition or even boundary condition and see how it behaves. So I think a lot of statistical physics. It's really similar to doing that, but with like physical constraints. It's like because this has to be real rather than I think the data can be whatever dimensions they want. I mean, it can have a, whatever symmetry or asymmetry they want, while the physical systems are more limited to physical laws. I, I think statistics, at least like really basic statistics, is kind of this thing that gets hidden in physics degrees without. A lot of people being formally taught in it. Like I know most people doing their PhD in physics, at least at my university, they never took a stats course ever. Somehow, even though I I think that should change. I think undergrad physics students should take like one stats course at the very least, because yeah. statistical mechanics, quantum mechanics is just a theory of probability and statistics. When you do experiments, you need to know statistics. And but again, it's it's a lot simpler stuff typically than the more complicated statistics like you're doing. But I don't know. I always found it weird that in physics, it kind of gets swept under the rug, and you're kind of just expected to like slowly learn the basic statistics without anyone ever telling you. Yeah, you know. that's so true. I think also like there's a huge. Well, I'm I've just finished like a teaching course on um, how to teach statistics and how to teach math, so this is like pretty relevant. But I think a lot of yeah. So first of all, statistics education should be in like every field it doesn't matter what you're doing if you're doing research and you're using any type of numerical data like quantitative data you're probably going to have to do some statistics so i think that should be like more emphasized in our education but also like the first year statistics courses are so bad like they get such a bad rep everyone hates statistics because the first thing they teach you is to how to calculate all these like quantities by hand they give you this big row of numbers and they're like calculate the standard deviation okay so you calculate the mean and then you take that mean away from every single number and then you like it's 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 too much um i think that there needs to be more of an emphasis on like statistical thinking and the the practicality of statistics and less on like the physical I mean, do it once, make sure you can do it. But we have machines that do that now. I've never calculated standard deviation by hand since I took like a, a 200 level stats course, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I get that. But I actually have a different take on, on, on the stat education. I feel like, yes, if it's good, if there's a course on, you know, practicality stuff on, on stats. But I think as a physics student, I don't want to learn the very super formal, rigorous stats. Why? Because I'm gonna start doubting the physics too much. It's like, <laughs> yeah, your hand wavy this. Yeah, that's, this is fast and loose. You can't do that. You can't assume this is your subset of this. You can't assume that. Like, you know, it's kind of gonna ruin a lot of physics, <laughs> at least for for like the, you know, the physicists because we we just do this hand wavy arguments. In the eyes of us, it's fine, but in the eyes of mathematician and statistician, probably like, yeah, this is not true. <laughs> Yeah, and I think as a statistician, the more training I get, the more skeptical I am of like literally any article that's ever been published. I've had assignments where we literally just, the assignment was to get a um, paper from a non-stats journal and see if, like as a statistician, look through it. If you were the reviewer, what would you pick apart? And it is crazy what gets published out there. Like just bad statistics, like unvalid, like, it's yeah the more you know the like everyone always says knowledge is pain because the more that you know the more you know and it becomes like you get more skeptical you get more critical and that's kind of difficult in stats to always like understand how to apply this and how to like really understand the results and take them with a grain of salt because every study that we do has limitations and there's a really good quote. It says, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. So I always think yeah, about Peter that. Peter Poo told me that. 
<laughs> Peter well, Poole. Love Peter Poole. The goat. Yeah. But that's like that's a that's an that's another problem in physics is that as far as mathematicians are concerned, physicists just break many rules and it works a lot of the time. Um and then later in down the road they realize, oh it works most of the time, but not quite always. So like I think like quantum field theory itself, like that's this huge life changing many Nobel Prize winning kind of field in physics that it's it's the best thing we have and it's as far as like mathematicians are concerned it kind of does it shouldn't work for a lot of reasons you get all these problems called like renormalization and you get divergences and you get a lot of things that just shouldn't work but physicists we we don't care we make it work in a lot of ways but the problems bite you in the butt later um yeah like I, i'm in this course right now and we were doing some integrals and i remember the the guy the, the prof's teaching and he's like all right we have this diverging integral but as physicists we don't care and we can <laughs> we can like hand wave our way through the integral and it gives you something that mathematically like shouldn't work but it does and when you do the experiment it matches the experiment and it's like we we're, we don't really understand why it works even though it shouldn't but yeah not maybe maybe not relate to statistics but I just did some asymptotic theory expansion at infinity too, so I understand what it means. Like w- one of the common saying in the in the class by the problem is like, "Oh, the mathematician is gonna get mad at this." Uh, oh, this is uh, for the mathematician in the class. Uh, don't look at this because you would write like f of x at infinity. It's like well, or like in, in, infinity plus. Zero minus. Like, what does it mean, man? <laughs> well, asymptotics. I think mathematically, they're actually pretty sound. Um, I do a lot of asymptotics, but again, as physicists, we just say like it works. But I think behind it, there's a lot of underlying like analysis and actual good math, unlike what we do. Well, I f- like my example would be like separation of variables as we see in E and M and stuff, right? Are you solving in this? You know, it's integral or whatever, or like this differential equation. Like, oh, dy dx is dy, and d dx is separate. <laughs> like, can, can you work it like like a fraction? Mathematicians would be like, yeah, uh, what what kind of manifold you work on? It's like I don't know. It works, man. <laughs> and so 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 moving away from how physicists do everything improperly, uh, at least mathematically, and back to statistics, uh. Are there any areas where you're like, oh, yeah, I'm so excited to work with the, these type of data or, oh, God, not these people again uh, in, in terms of doing your um, uh, kind of consulting work? Yeah, there's areas of stats that I find really scary. Um, and there's some that I'm like, oh, so cool. Most of the ones that I'm like, oh, so cool. It's health. Like, I think health data is really cool. And the really scary ones is also in health, like genetics where you have these data sets that are like so dense, so large, so confusing. You can't use your regular stats because you have like more features for each observation than you have observations. And yeah, I I feel like I will never work on genetics problems. That's just not something that I'm really interested in. But yeah, I really like clinical observational data because a lot of really weird things happen. And there's really cool methods that you can use to like account for all of those in the analysis. I know at again, not to steer the conversation to physics, but it's the only thing I know. Um, I know at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, they have big data. I don't want to say problems, but they create so much data, like just a stupid amount. So they have a lot of, I imagine, you know, statisticians and yeah. people who know statistics that come in and they can create these algorithms that'll take this just insane amount of data and filter out the important stuff so i i, I wonder if that they've kind of used that in other fields as well like the like dna and medical they research. have yeah yeah one of my friends works on like literally just looking at a gene and a gene expression and trying to figure out like which ones might possibly be related to a trait or something and it's a huge just a statistical problem because you can't just look at every single gene expression individually because some of them are correlated um there's again the data is like massive 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 um so i probably will never touch that type of stuff but it is really similar you can use methods like dimension um, reduction methods 
like principal component analysis, but then you kind of lose your interpretation and there's different kind of statistical tests that you can run, but it's not something that I will probably ever work on, to be honest. I wonder how it actually work when when in your head uh, because like I'm not I I don't really know. Well, like let's say you want to analyze some data, the, do you develop your algorithm symbolically on paper and apply? Oh, I want to filter out this, so I'm adding this function, or, or is it like oh no, I'm gonna go code right away? It's like if a less than two, uh, uh, filter out this data or. You know, I'm not sure how you develop your algorithm, but I would like my algorithm out on paper and yeah. then code it later. Yeah, and that's usually what I do, at least. Like a lot of the things that I work on, like the methodology is mostly like available in packages, so you can like call functions that do the algorithm for you, but you just have to like add to it or tweak it a little bit. Like you might weight some things, for example. Um, but the first step when you get data is, and this is like. 90, 80, 90 percent of your data analysis is data cleaning. So you need to literally look at the study and kind of figure out what you need to do with the mess. Like you have missing values. What are you going to do with those? You have your ages. Your study was supposed to be restricted from ages 18 to 24. But then someone who's 17 joined in. Do you remove them? You have people who are like inclusion, exclusion criteria. You have dates that you have to deal with and you have to make them like relative times. So you're doing a lot of like cleaning to get the data in a form that you can analyze. And then you look at like the issues with the data. So for me, I look at um, an ICU data or just like, let's say you have a doctor's office. I would say, oh, well, Healthy people don't really go to the doctor that often. So if you're really sick, you're more likely to go see the doctor and have an observation recorded. Well, then your observation time is related to the reason why you're going to the clinic and that can bias the results. So I would write that down. We have to deal with that. Um, we have The treatment isn't randomized. I'd write that down. And there's different methods, like depending on what you want to do, what you're trying to you know, what relationship you're trying to describe overall will depend on the model you choose. And then you can do different things to like aid that model and dealing with those other issues, for example. Oh, so it's like building Legos from all these different small subroutines. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, some people literally develop methodology from scratch. I am not at that point in my research career. I usually you identify a weakness in a model and you try to like either compete with it or you try to go into that model and add something to it to make it a little bit better. And that's your small contribution. I thought it'd be like on paper, you're like, oh, you know, this R this is my random variable R. And this is my random variable A. I'm doing these operations called function F of A. I mean, there is, you know? there is some of that, especially when you're like diving into I mean, I'm more talking about like the process of analyzing the data once you have the algorithm. But when you're developing the method or the algorithm, whatever you want to call it, that's exactly what you're doing. You are writing down all the notation. You are proving stuff. You are looking at the asymptotics. You are, you know, looking at the assumption, underlying assumptions like, oh, if, if this is true, these two things are have to be independent. So that's an assumption that we have to make. And you're writing that down and a pretty rigorous process. I have, um, before we run out of time, I have like a question. Uh, yeah. Can you talk, you and your supervisor, it was bound to come up at some point. You guys became, oh, yeah. Yeah, you guys are a little famous now um, for separate Ooh. reasons, completely unrelated. But can you, can you comment on that a bit? So, so you've been showing up in the news, at least in Nova Scotia, I think, right? Or is yeah, it... pretty much across Canada now. Oh, wow. For yes. crocheting, I believe, right? Yes. So what happened yeah. there? Yeah, so I basically was extremely overworked and stressed for like so many reasons in 2020 to 2021. One of which was because of the um, mass shooting that occurred in one of the neighboring communities where I um, was living at the time at my hometown, Truro, 
gets a lot of hate, but you know, I live there. And yeah, I needed a stress relief and I started doing something called No Statistics Saturdays to try to take back some work-life balance. And one day I just started crocheting. And then two years later, I made a Maude Lewis inspired sweater that went viral. And now I have been on like CBC, CTV, Global, and a bunch of like local newspapers and organizations and stuff. So that's been really funny and completely unrelated to my research. But my supervisor, Michael Wallace, they've been in the news for the past three years, I think, since 2020 for kind of like breaking down the online roll up the rim contest. And they've pretty much achieved an accuracy of like winning 80% of their spins, which is just wild. And that's honestly the research that I think my parents are the most interested in as non-scientists, which is hilarious. But yeah, we were both on the front page of CBC, like within hours of each other uh, last week. And it was super funny. But they've basically done this pro this roll up the rim project kind of like as a teaching tool, which I think is so cool. So you can go into my prof's class and they're talking about like how you can use statistics to win free coffee. Like, come on. Anyway, I love the story. It's so fun. Um, Michael gave me the inside scoop like a week before the article came out. So my parents started rolling at like 4 a.m. or whatever the ideal time was. And they also won like 75% of the time. So the power statistics. Of, yeah, the power of math and statistics. It's true. It's so true. Yeah, so that's kind of our little fun tidbit. And it's been really interesting. And I've never talked so much about myself in my life. <laughs> but that's okay. So, I think I have two more things. So first maybe a little bit of your your interest in terms of background like what got you into well i think in the first place physics and math and stuff like what's the experience going up was it like like liam who was obsessed with it in school or or it was like what was challenging for him in school and he was uh, uh, going to physics out of spite or was it like <laughs> gen genuine interest um, I think I was just like naturally very good at it. I'm a very type A person. So those arts courses where you had like subjective grading drove me nuts. I was like, I know that this is right. You know, X plus whatever equals this, then X is this. Like that is the right answer. And I really liked like there being a right answer, you know, I was just that type of person. And I was very good at it and I like routines and stuff like that so it start yeah it started as a young age like I always loved math I remember one year my friend and I tried to do every single textbook question in the math textbook and we were like weeks ahead of the content and it drove our teachers nuts because the, the teacher would be like all right do problem 12b and I just like flip back and be like I already did it <laughs> <laughs> incredible so, yeah and I think I don't know why my graduating class, everyone became engineers. Like, I don't know why they were pushing everyone to go into engineering. They're like, you're good at math. You should be an engineer. And I was like, uh, I don't really care about bridges and stuff. And I just, my sister went to St. of X and I like was a little anxiety kid and I want to be close to someone I knew. So I went to St. of X and I just was in general science. I had absolutely no idea what I did. I loved Peter Poole's physics class and Ping Wang's calculus class. And then I guess the rest is kind of history. I found my groove and I just kind of went with it. And now here I am. I, I mean, I never expected to do graduate school. Let me be very clear. This was like a very surprising thing for me. I'm like a first gen student. My parents would have been like, what? I barely graduated my undergrad, to be honest. Not because of my grades, but because, like, I was so stressed and it was just, it was a time. It was a time. But yeah, here we are. You did it and you made the most out of it. That, that engineering comment was really funny. Yeah, in high, yeah. School, in high school, they're always pushing everyone to be engineers, I guess. Like, I, I think know. we've all experienced that here, right? Because we all didn't do engineering, but we, we, we went down a very similar path. We took all the math and physics and science courses. And so. Circuits with the engineers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we can tell people you 
We, we, we could be. We chose not to be. Exactly. So the, the second part of the, well, the, my query is about the future, Grace. You know, what are your hopes and dreams? Who do you see yourself being? In the future, or who would you like to be? Who you? Who is your passion to be? I want to be someone with a balance in my life. So I am actually not thinking about going the academic, the pure academic route, like becoming a researcher. I like it, but I don't necessarily love it. I really want to be able to like do my hobbies and have like. Honestly, like crocheting is a huge part of my life, especially now, and I want to continue to do that, and you know, have time for family and friends and travel and stuff. And yeah, I I'm starting a lecturing position in the fall, so I'm hoping that that kind of gets me a better idea of what I want to do. But right now, I think I want to be like an instructor or like、um, a teaching professor would be like as academic as I would get. Or do more consulting or work at like a a public health unit. Yeah. How did you get into? How did you get that lecturing position opportunity? I'm interested in that. Yeah, they basically just put out a call for a lot of like students in my program become lecturers at least one time. So I just did like a teaching training workshop. It literally finished yesterday. Where I had like a practicum, I got to do a mock or not a mock lecture. I took over a lecture for someone, got evaluated, and they basically like give you the thumbs up or thumbs down to continue in the future. So yeah, it's an opportunity that is provided to most PhD students, I would say, if they're interested at my university anyway. I think there's a little um, um, different in different disciplines because let's、like、say PhD student in, in the humanities, like in history, for example, they come in expected. To teach a course, yeah, which is not true for a lot of like science-based、um, PhDs, but like those、uh, more like humanities-based, they are like they kind of have to teach teach a course as a part of their program, even. Yeah, I don't know if that's a thing at my university. I mean, I've I've taught lectures before, but it was like it was filling in. Like my my supervisor was away for a week, so I taught his class for that week, kind of thing. It wasn't like I've never heard of anything where like, hey, if you guys want to teach a course. Come, come, do it. I've never seen that at my university, at least. So that's really cool that you get that opportunity because I think I'd like to do that if I could. I I know it happens a lot in my department, at least at the University of Alberta, where they just put out calls for lecturers. Not so much with the university anymore. I know it used to be a thing, but they've cut back on that just because something about the quality of education <laughs>、uh, being a little bit different when it comes from a PhD student.、Uh, but I I mean, there's. Multiple universities in Edmonton, where they're always looking for lecturers. Especially, my department includes all the geologists, and that's very popular in Alberta. Very cool. Yeah, I am interested to see how it goes, and I do think it's a really cool opportunity. I mean, we've all been TAs and kind of done like a lot of the administrative and marking stuff, but yeah, I want to. It's going to be fun to be like in control of the material, and it's a third year. Biostatistics course that like people from different disciplines can take too, like a lot of public health students and I think they said a lot of math business people take it. So yeah, it's going to be a really interesting opportunity. And I'd say if it's something that interests you, it doesn't hurt to like talk to your prof about it because they might be like, please teach my lecture. I mean the pay sucks, but it's more for the experience. So all <laughs> so. Since you are deep in PhD, right? Like, if you get a job in industry with your PhD pro,、uh, PhD degree, so what would you say is like your advantage than just like you being like an undergrad stats graduate, right? Like, you know, what, are there certain tech company or like you know, advanced research company that only hire PhD? Just like that's why you're doing this degree, or is it like, or do you think you can learn all this stuff on the job after undergrad? Or do you think PhD is a very good program for preparing for your career? I would say at least a master's. Like, I mean, again, I didn't come from a stats undergrad, so it's kind of hard for me to talk to about this. But for example, like doing a math undergrad, I don't think I would have been able to do a job as a statistician. I just did not have the skills or the knowledge. After my master's, I became much more confident. I was like, yeah, I could probably get a decent job here.、Um, But especially in the PhD, I think just a lot of like my critical thinking skills, like, and 
general knowledge and you know so many different skills that you acquire communication statistical communication is so important and like my experiences from the consulting and TAing and teaching and stuff um, are really important I know there are some jobs that prefer PhDs um, they like literally say that on the like in industry um, but I don't think it's always necessary and especially if you're not interested in research like if you want to go work in tech as a statistician or a data scientist I don't think you need a PhD. If you want to go work in like public health and be a biostatistician, say with Nova Scotia Health, they're probably going to expect you to have some sort of graduate degree, if not a PhD. So yeah, I didn't do it strictly out of job prospects, but it will it will help me in the end. I don't really know why I did it. I'm not. I don't regret it, but some days I shake my head. I know we all have those days. Just going with the flow. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Day by day, I say. Very nice. This is pretty enlightening and fun story. So it looks like we're going to be running out of time. So we're going to thank Grace for her you know, expertise on statistics and whatnot. <laughs> so we're going to move on to the story for today. And someone has the story, but, story, but before that, Patrick is going to be telling us about how to reach us and perhaps Grace. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much, Grace, for coming on. Uh, we are more than happy to have you. Uh, if you have any questions for Grace, uh, the first way that you can contact us is through our Gmail account. We are hyperthesispodcast at gmail.com. So you can send us an email if you have any questions uh, or comments, or if you want to also be a guest on our show. We have had quite the string of guests on recently, and we are always excited to have an opportunity to have someone new on. So if you have uh, an area of research that you really want to talk about and also talk a bit about yourself and what you do, then please let us know. Uh, if you have any questions for Grace specifically, is there a good way to contact you? Sure, yeah. I'm pretty easy to reach. I'm on LinkedIn, Grace Tompkins. Uh, I have an email. I have a web page. If you literally Google Grace Tompkins, you Waterloo, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one. Scroll through the crochet uh, CBC articles and eventually you'll find like my academic stuff. It's kind of being, uh, it's very crochet heavy on Google right now. But yeah, I also have it. You can email me. It's G-T-O-M-P-K-I-N at uwaterloo.ca. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty reachable. Or you can connect with Patrick Leo Murphy and they can send you my way. Yeah, and uh, I guess if they see you on TikTok, maybe give you a follow. Yeah, yeah. There's not a lot of math content on there, but I might maybe I'll branch into that. <laughs> there you are. Um, and if you do want to reach out to the Hyperthesis team at all, uh, we're also on inter Instagram. You can find us at the Hyperthesis, uh, where we post updates. Uh, so once this episode goes live, you'll be able to see an update about it. We also post memes and some behind the scenes looks. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel. We are in the process of getting that updated. Uh, there's just been some delays, but we will get back into that eventually. Uh, and if you want to listen to us, which you are doing right now, you can find us pretty much on any podcasting service uh, available. We are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and pretty much wherever you get your podcast. We are based out of Spotify, but don't let that stop you from finding us elsewhere. And if you do find us and listen to us, feel free to leave a review so we can know how we did. And uh, now just moving on to the final story. This is something we didn't get to talk about much this podcast, but it's a just a short story on someone with the last name Bayes. So if you've ever taken a stats course at all, uh, in any math related stats course or other science related stats course, you've probably heard the term Bayesian statistics. Well, we won't get into the specifics of that. Maybe we'll save that for a different episode. Um, I want to talk briefly about the person behind the name because I, I, I've talked to people and they're like, oh yeah, it, it's just a name and they don't realize that's an actual person who came up with these ideas. Now, Thomas Bayes was an English mathematician. He was also a philosopher and a Presbyterian minister who was the son of a minister from London in England. But... Thomas Bayes was born in Hertfordshire in 1701. Now, not much is known about his childhood, 
but it is known that he attended the University of Edinburgh in 1719 to study both logic and theology. Now, after graduating, he helped his father with chapel duties uh, in London for quite a long time before moving to Kent in 1930. 1834, or 1734, sorry. Um, and, and there he became a minister of his own church until 1752. So in 1731, he published his first work. Uh, so at the age of 30, he published The Divine Be Benevolence, or an attempt to prove that the principal end of the divine providence and government is the happiness of his creature. That is all one title. It's quite the mouthful. Uh, but this was more so related to his ministerial work um, and his theological studies. But he produced a more profound work titled An Int Introduction to the Doctrine of Fluxians and a Defense of the Mathematicians Against the Objections of the Author of the Analyst. Again, quite, quite another mouthful. Uh, it's uh, a, a very long title, but essentially this was a defense of calculus at the time known as Fluxians. Uh, and specifically the type of calculus developed by Isaac Newton, uh, who is also an English mathematician and theorist. Uh, so he published this very long titled book about fluxions or calculus in 1936, and essentially it was a rebuttal against a previous published paper called The Analyst uh, that essentially showed that, oh yeah, calculus is flawed. And so Bayes went ahead and said, actually, no, it's not. Here's the logic behind it. Calculus is quite solid. Now, this work was so well done that Bayes was accepted as a fellow of the Royal Society in 1742, which is a very high honor. Uh, now, many of the people who accepted him, uh, their names aren't as familiar, but some past members of the Royal Society include Newton himself, so it's quite a high honor, uh, especially within England. Now, there's actually no evidence that he published anything else during his life aside from these two works, which is very interesting, but it must have been quite the work to be able to get into the Royal Society pretty much right away. Now, later on in his life, Bayes took an interest in probability. After possibly reading different texts, there's some controversy in the world of statistics about uh, where exactly he received his inspiration from. But uh, by reading the works of contemporary mathematicians and statisticians, uh, which I don't even know if they were called statisticians at the time, but uh, regardless, he was able to read those works, be inspired by them, and started his own work in statistics. Now, unfortunately, he was unable to publish any of this work during his lifetime. He became very sick in 1755, and unfortunately passed away in 1761, uh, six years later. However, he handed over his notes to a close friend named Richard Price, who was responsible for introducing his work to the world. So Richard Price was able to get his work published, and that is how we arrived at Bayesian statistics, is posthumously. I didn't know that. So, yeah. So, uh, for example, there's some of his work, which is cited in his name, but published after his death. Um, so, so it's very interesting that he never realized the impact he would have on the world. And there are still many debates taking place in science, whether you want to be a Bayesian uh, statistician or a frequentist, uh, which we didn't really get into either. Um, but it's really incredible the power that he had, and especially not realizing what he was doing and how important it was. And unfortunately, he did get sick before he could live to see the day when these ideas were accepted. But because of Thomas Bayes, we have this wide range of statistical methods that we can use, um, and I'm sure Grace or really anyone who does statistics at all and their researcher in their life can tell you that this impact is quite profound. It is, and there's so much. I wish we had like we could talk about this for hours. There's so much beef in like the early statistics community. It's actually hilarious. Like not so much with Bayesian versus frequentist statistics, but just like other prominent statisticians would like write letters to each other and like just tear each other apart it's insane but yeah i live with the bayesian my roommate's a bayesian statistician and i'm more of a frequentist but i i also like bayesian stats very very cool if you guys ever look at bay's rule it's like very very cool all right cool 
thank you very much, Patrick, for the story. And well, thank you, Grace, again for this amazing episode. Thanks for having me. I guess I'll see you guys next week. Take care. Bye, everyone. See you.